We're here today with Laureate Professor John Aiken at Newcastle University in Australia. John, thanks for your time. My great pleasure. Firstly, why Newcastle? Uh, Newcastle, uh, I came here a bit by accident to be honest. Um, someone offered me a job at the University of Newcastle and I thought they meant Newcastle on Tyne. At the time I was in the University of Edinburgh. Um, but I came over here and became deeply associated with the university. I now run the medical faculty within the university. And I've come to realise what uh, a fabulous institution it is. Uh, we are ranked number one for medical research in the country. Uh, we have a fabulous group of staff here. And we have a particular emphasis in this university on reproductive health. And that's one of my areas of passion. How does Newcastle University compete on a global scale when it comes to IVF and reproductive technology and research? Yes, so we, um, the university has set itself up uh, to create a number of priority research centres. Clearly no university has been good at everything. Uh, so we have decided to focus on a number of areas and one of those key uh, leading areas is reproductive health. And that was because we happened to have a group of people at this university for whom reproductive health and reproductive science was very important. And I would say we are one of the, probably the top three reproductive health groups in the world, um, doing work on both male and female reproduction, both the uh, whole process of infertility, also fertility control, and also pregnancy and parturition. So all aspects of the reproductive process we cover. And we have a critical mass of, of uh, uh, science, clinicians, and fantastic state-of-the-art facilities to study this area. In terms of your own reproductive health research mm -hmm. journey? Mm -hmm. So for me personally, it started at uh, University of Cambridge. I'm a biochemist by training. I did my uh, early research, my PhD work on reproduction in wild animals, actually. And then spent some time in the World Health Organization in Geneva, thinking about reproduction from a human perspective. And then went back to the UK and spent 25 years building a research group looking at reproductive health with a particular emphasis on the male. Uh, male infertility is the most common cause of human infertility. Roughly one in five males suffers from infertility. Uh, so it's very prevalent and we have next to no idea what causes it. So I thought this was a very important area to look into. Uh, I also worked quite a lot on male contraception. I, again, we have contraceptive met methods for women. We don't have contraceptive methods for men. So I started that research program in the UK and then uh, came over to um, the University of Newcastle in 1999. Been here for exactly 20 years now and really enjoyed it and has really established a fantastic group here. Uh, working in this area. While it's not something you'd like to probably talk about, you are recognised as a global leader in the field? Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess so. Um, I, uh, <coughs> there are some prizes they give out in reproductive science. The most important one is the uh, Carl Hartman Award. This is a, given out by the Society for Reproductive Biology in the United States and uh, only twice in the 25 years this prize has been offered has it ever gone out of North America and uh, I won it uh, the year after my PhD supervisor in Cambridge won it so it was very nice that the supervisor and the student won this prize and we're the only people to have won this prize outside of North America so um, um, that was very fulfilling and uh, I guess uh, says something about uh, the contribution that we have made to reproductive science as a whole. Talking a bit closer about the Felix device, yeah. can you explain, probably in layman's terms, how it works and why it's important? So my uh, involvement with Felix really started uh, actually when I, shortly after I got to Newcastle and one of my first tasks in Newcastle was to set up a degree in biotechnology uh, with clinical uh, and industrial placements associated with it. So I got to visit a lot of biotech companies in Sydney and one of those was a company called Gradipor. And I became uh, good friends with Tim Warren, who was the CEO of Gradipor at the time. And uh, they built a, a device, the Gradiflow device, which was used to separate molecules on the basis of size and charge. And I suggested to Tim one day that we could use this technology to separate cells. So we bought, uh, built a prototype device called the CS10 and I said, I think I have the perfect cells to try this on. 
And so we'll try it to, uh, to see if it can effectively separate human sperm cells because the IVF industry needs a mechanism to separate good cells. And so it was, and basically it separates these cells on the basis of their unique size. They are the smallest cells in the body and their high net negative charge. So uh, it's essentially an electrophoretic technique that isolates the cells on the basis of their small charge, uh, small size and high electric charge. How do you guarantee that mm. DNA is not compromised mm. by using this technology? Yeah. So one of the uh, attributes of this particular technique is unlike conventional techniques, we don't use any centrifugation. So the way you usually isolate cells in IVF programs is to centrifuge them. These involve uh, shearing forces uh, as you, you isolate cells on the basis of high G forces. Uh, our technique involves uh, no addition of no chemicals, nothing to the cells. Uh, it doesn't involve any shearing forces associated with centrifugation. And it's very quick, unlike centrifugation or another technique which is often used, which is swim up. It takes a fraction of the time that those techniques take. And the cells that it's isolating are those with the highest net negative charge. And those are the cells which have the least levels of DNA damage within them. So moving forward to a user case example, mm. how would you see it used in an andrology centre? Yeah, so the first time we ever used it uh, was uh, when I received a phone call from actually Sydney IVF, who had a patient uh, who had been uh, infertile for about 10 years, tried many different uh, times uh, to have IVF, never worked. He had high levels of DNA damage in his spermatozoa. So we took our prototype device down and uh, isolated cells from him. This, the subpopulation we isolated had very low levels of DNA damage. We collected those cells, injected it into one of, uh, injected a single spermatozoon into one of his wife's eggs, and uh, she immediately conceived and had a child, and uh, subsequently had another child using exactly the same technology. Uh, we were encouraged by that uh, pilot study and we then did a much larger clinical study at Westmead Hospital. And in Westmead Hospital we selected uh, quite a large group of patients and uh, used this technique. Uh, and also the conventional method of uh, isolating cells. And then um, just selected the best embryo for transfer to, irrespective of how it was prepared. And the outcome of all of that was to show that our technique was a very effective, at least as effective as conventional methods for uh, establishing a pregnancy. And uh, in fact, pregnancy rates were higher with our device than they were with con conventional methods. Although the study wasn't really powered to uh, say that with confidence, nevertheless, pregnancy rates were higher. So it's at least as good as conventional technologies and takes a fraction of the time. So just touching on that, why would an andrology centre use this technology? Yeah, because I think as a matter of best practice, andrology centres should select cells with the lowest levels of DNA damage. Uh, there's quite a lot of data out there suggesting that high levels of DNA damage are not good either for pregnancy or for the health and well-being of the offspring. So we should, as a matter of best practice, select the cells with the lowest levels of DNA damage. And this technology, this new technology, enables us to do just that. It's much better than conventional technologies and takes a fraction of the time. In terms of now moving into the commercial rollout, yeah. there's a piece I think investors don't quite understand and that is around the KOLs, the key opinion leaders. Yeah. Are you able to explain a little bit about A, how they were selected and why they're so important yeah. to this project? So the reason, first of all, the reason why they're so important is uh, I work in a research laboratory. I can develop the principles on which we will isolate cells and I can show in a laboratory setting uh, how effective it is. But really to understand the commercial potential in this device, you've got to get it out in the field and you've got to see how it performs under field conditions. So I've been in the field a long time. Uh, I've made lots of contacts. So I have a wide network of colleagues that I know and trust and they do very high quality work. And essentially we picked 15 of those. Uh, the best laboratories in the world, and they are all over the world, that I know run high quality operations. And we've given them a device each, and we've agreed on the protocols that they will use. And what we're keen to do now is to get feedback from the clinics on how this device actually performs under field conditions. Some may think 
there is a risk associated with giving this technology to another group to test. Why are you so confident they're going to run the test correctly and give you the results you want? Yeah. So first of, first of all, I've picked people who uh, are extremely experienced in the field. And uh, I've picked people whose work I know and trust. Uh, we have developed a, a very tightly defined protocol for doing these studies. They've uh, agreed to abide by our protocols. I'm sure the studies will be conducted in the way that we have uh, designed them. And, uh, and because their operations are such good quality, I really trust the data. Uh, there is no guarantee that this system is going to work. Uh, and I'm not, so we would never go into a trial knowing the answer. Um, uh, I'm very hopeful that they will find in these more extensive clinical trials the same thing that we found in our preliminary clinical trials, which is it is a very effective way of isolating cells and improving the quality of the gametes that are used for IVF. I can't guarantee that. What I can say is that it's in the best hands in the world to see whether that assertion is actually true. When you hand these devices over to yeah. these KOLs, do you yeah. do it with confidence? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm confident in the device. I've seen it through uh, our own clinical trials. I've seen it in operation over a large number of years. This device wasn't invented yesterday. Uh, it's been perfected over a period of a, a more than a decade, actually. Uh, so uh, I'm very confident that the prototypes we've developed now are very refined and very effective. And I think they will be so impressed by the device that they will refuse to give them back to me at the end of the trial. That actually happened. The first trials that I did in Westmead Hospital um, were with our prototype device. And at the end of it, they wanted to keep the device to continue using it. So I, I, am, I am confident that we will get good quality data and the data will be very supportive of our assertion that this is the way of the future. This is how spermatozoa will be isolated in IVF cr country, uh, clinics across the world, ultimately. You look very excited and you look proud. Yeah, I am. I am very proud of it. It's a device that uh, has been a long time in the making. It's not been a linear journey, it's often the case. Uh, we've had many twists and turns, many ups and downs. But now I think we're in the best place we can possibly be. Uh, we've got a good network of people who are working with us to evaluate the system. Um, we've got it in the hands of a company who are passionate about the device, as passionate about it as I am. And I think if this device has any potential for commercialization at all, it will be realized now. Now is the moment for that uh, assessment. Looking forward, mm -hmm. this technology, how can it apply to other species outside of humans? Yeah. That's a great question and uh, the device that we have currently has really been refined for human use uh, where often we are not after a large number of sperm cells, we're after a high quality sperm cells. So the device has been set up really to uh, optimize the quality of the gametes that we generate. When you turn to domestic animal reproduction in the, and the major markets would be in horses and cattle, uh, then you're talking about mostly artificial insemination as the means of insemination. For most cattle breeding across the world, it's artificial insemination. And there you need much larger recoveries of cells. So we're going to have to engineer a change in the scale of the device. So we isolate larger numbers. The fundamental principles will be the same, but there will be some refinement that will be needed in order to get this machine suited to commercial animal uh, use. We have done pilot studies with equine spermatozoa and we know that it works very effectively with that. Uh, we've done some initial studies now with bovine spermatozoa and I think it will be the same there. How fast do you <coughs> think the research cycle would be for a product outside of humans mm -hmm. given the time it's taken to get to where we are now with the yeah. Felix device for humans? Do you think it's a similar, similar lineage in terms of time or is it... No, no, I think we, ha we have climbed the mountain. We're standing now on the top of the mountain. The uh, clinical application that is for human use will be ascertained in the next 12 months. And uh, at the same time, uh, we are now developing the prototypes for uh, um, domestic animal use with the initial focus on uh, cattle and horses. And uh, I think that will all be done over a similar time, type of time course. In the next 18 months, we will know whether we can isolate the kind of numbers of cells we require for AI in cattle, in horses, and even potentially in humans. In terms of market size, mm. given your breadth of knowledge about the industry mm. from a human perspective, 
What do you see as the opportunity here for the Felix device? So uh, I think the potential for this device is uh, immense. Uh, ART, uh, assisted reproductive technologies, are now being widely used across the, uh, across the world actually to produce IVF children. Um, currently in Australia, 5% of all children are generated by IVF. In Denmark, currently 10% of children are generated by IVF, and in all um, developed countries, the vector is upwards. So it's 5% now, by 2025, it'll be 10% and so on. And there are very good reasons for believing that this is just going to continue to grow. Uh, there are already 8 million IVF babies in the world. Um, the technology, though, has remained unchanged since it was first introduced in the late 70s, early 80s. So, uh, I think now is a good time for us to revolutionise the technologies that we're using for IVF. Uh, not so much to increase efficiency, I don't make any claims for increased efficiency. What I am interested in is the safety of this particular procedure. And uh, the fact is that with IVF, unlike natural conceptions, the gametes, of the sperm or the eggs are not selected in the way that they are in vivo. So with this device, uh, we're able to select the highest quality sperm for uh, conception. And that will ensure, I think, the health and well-being of the offspring that are generated. And that's a matter of supreme importance to me and, I think, to the industry itself. Do you believe this device will be the standard device that sits in every andrology centre based on the the output you just mentioned? Yeah, no, I think absolutely that's going to be the case. So as I've already said, the technologies have remained unchanged really since the inception of the IVF therapy itself. And it's about time that they did change. This method enables you to isolate a very high quality of cells in a fraction of the time that conventional techniques take. So I don't see why this shouldn't be the default technique that all andrology laboratories use in the future for isolating cells for IVF this will become just part of the standard protocols that are used. Uh, I think this technology and other technologies relating to selection of uh, highest quality embryos are the two technologies that are going to carry this whole field forward in the immediate future. Was that little glimpse generated by how eager the KOLs were to be part of the study? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, you use the right word there, it is a collaboration. It's an intellectual and scientific collaboration because I think my colleagues can see how this technology will vastly improve the way in which we isolate cells, high quality cells, for assisted conception purposes. And ultimately, you know, our ambition is that everybody who goes home with an IVF baby knows that we have done everything possible to ensure the quality of the gametes that went into making that child. That the health and well-being of the children generated through ART is of the highest possible quality. And this technology will enable you to achieve just that. Professor John Aiken, thanks for your time. My great pleasure. Thank you.